I think the the time in bed restriction is pretty interesting. Yes. And, and, and in talking with sleep physicians mm -hmm. who also implement this, mm -hmm. it seems quite draconian at the outset. Uh, it can be remarkably difficult. Uh, like, you know, they're giving people five hours in bed max and, and they're really trying to force sleep pressure, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. So how do you... Um, uh, how do you navigate that and how do you decide how hard to squeeze the, yeah. the tube of toothpaste? Let me draw a line in the sand between what CBTI says broadly as a treatment and then how I've actually implemented it in my clinic. Mm -hmm. So what CBTI will have you do is they will have you, as a, and I say you as the royal you, your patient, they will have you fill out something called a sleep diary. And this is a paper diary that covers seven days. We have it. Love right? it. Because if I asked you how well you slept four nights ago... Like, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have it's like, to fill it's like it a up. food frequency questionnaire in epidemiology. Totally, total waste of time. Total. So you have to do it every morning. Yep. Okay. And of course, I'm not obsessed with it being exact because I'm much more interested in the picture, the pattern of it. Right. If you asked someone to fill it out for just one day and then worked with that, you'd have a totally distorted picture. You wouldn't know what you're working with. But what classic CBTI does is they'll take that seven day sleep diary, and then they will actually use it the time you got in bed time you fell asleep, how many times you woke up, um, how long you were awake, what time you woke up. It does a bunch of, it has all of these different uh, questions in it. And you can use that to calculate how much time a person was sleeping on average over the course of the week. And what CBTI does is it says, you patient, why don't you pick what time you want to get up every day? And then you you would ostensibly pick a time. And then the CBTI clinician would, t let's say your your sleep log said you were naturally sleeping six hours a night, right? The clinician would add 30 minutes to that and make it six and a half hours and then work backwards from your chosen wake time. So let's say you chose a wake time of, I don't know, 7 a.m. I would work back six and a half hours to get to a bedtime for you of 12.30 a.m., and of course, that's the bedtime of your childhood dreams, right? Imagine going to a sleepover and your friend's mom saying, all right, kids, you can't go to bed until after 12.30 a.m., right? Kids love it. Adults think this is this is torture, right? Because it is. So that's what classic CBTI would do. But six hours being the number? Six and a half. Six, six and a half. half, yeah. Right, yeah. you get that half hour of mm -hmm. grace, right? And as far as I know in CBTI, <sighs> Almost nobody's restricting less than five One and a half okay. hours. Got it. Five and a half seems to be the floor. Okay. So I've not seen people restricting to five. Um, there, there are a subset of people, and I don't know the data on this because I don't even know if the data exists on this, who are what we call genetically short sleepers. Yep. And these people know who they are. They have always been like this. They've, they've, it's not, and it's not upsetting and distressing and causing them grief, right? Yep. Those are... We're not talking about those people. Yep. Okay, so that's what CBTI will do. And just to be clear, let's say five and a half is the floor. Mm -hmm. Six is typically what you would do. So six and a half in bed. So, well, no, if if your body is producing six hours of sleep, I add 30 and I get six and a half. Yep. If your body is producing only five and a half, I add 30 and you get six. So I do this I computationally it. for each person. I see. So when I bring my sleep log to you, and you've seen that for the past week, I've been spending 12 hours in bed. Mm -hmm. But by my recollection, because I'm looking at the clock when I'm not sleeping, I'm only getting six and a half hours of sleep in the 10 or 12 hours I'm laying there. Mm -hmm. You're going to say, oh, okay, that's your sleep time. Take that, add 30, that's your time in bed, working back. I got it. Yes. And here's where um, what I do is slightly different but also keeps the, 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 the whole theoretical underpinning is not disturbed at all by the way that I do this. Mm -hmm. So how many times have you had a patient come to you and say, oh, you know, I really want to be that person who wakes up at 5 a.m., gets a go on my day. I want to get my exercise in. I want to get my meal prep in, do all this stuff. And you're like, oh, okay, cool, cool. So you want to be a 5 a.m. person. What time do you get up now? Oh, like 11. And I'm like, oh, okay, all right. Okay. So this whole part in CBTI where people choose their wake time, that's not a thing for me. In my clinic, we play a game called democracy within a dictatorship. And what that just means is that instead of just letting patients carte blanche choose their wake time, I actually look at their sleep diary and I let them think they're choosing their wake time. And if I agree with it, 
they will have chosen. If I don't, the dictator comes in. And I look at their diary and if they are getting up at 7 a.m., 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 7 a.m., 6 a.m., 6 a.m., 6 a.m., and they say to me, oh, I want to wake up at 8.30, I will say, well, we have no evidence that you can sleep until 8.30. That's not realistic. But we have evidence that you can sleep until 6 because four of the last seven days you made it until 6. So 6 o'clock is your wake time. And this is not anywhere in CBTI. I've spoken with a lot of my colleagues who do CBTI and asked them, how do you choose a wake time? And there is no standardized method. But by using this method, I'm definitely making sure that I'm at least gating the patient's sleep at a reasonable time. Because if I let that patient just to choose 8.30 a.m. as their wake time, and they were only producing six and a half hours of sleep. They're going to bed at one in the morning. They're going to bed at two in the morning. And they're getting up at 8.30 because they chose their wake time as 8.30, but really they're going to wake up at like six or seven and they're not even going to cash in on the full six and a half hours that they should be getting in bed. So I've added in this uh, this component of my own mm -hmm. of setting their wake time to be a much more reasonable time. And then what I do before giving them a bedtime, I give them a week at that wake time. And I see how much sleep is your body producing with this new wake time. Now, um, let's say you're doing the sleep log mm -hmm. and they're spending, you know, eight hours in bed, getting four hours of sleep. Uh, let's say they're getting five hours of sleep, mm -hmm. eight hours in bed, mm -hmm. and then they're taking an hour nap a day. Oof. So they're removing all their sleep pressure during mm -hmm. the day by mm -hmm. taking that nap, mm -hmm. but they kind of need to take the nap because they're not getting enough sleep. So they're in this yeah. vicious cycle. So do you add the hour of nap time back to sleep and say, actually, you're getting six hours of sleep. Let's do the exercise based on five plus one plus no, a half, 6.5. No, 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 no. We want to extinguish that sleeping during the day thing. So there's a difference between a person without insomnia healthily using naps and there's a person and then there's a person with insomnia who's napping to compensate for what's not happening at night. So I think that to best explain this, I should just finish this example of the wake time thing. So if people, because this directly ties in, if I'm setting their wake time and then I'm seeing how much time they're actually producing sleep, that first week when I give them the wake time, I don't give them a bedtime. I don't even do time in bed restriction that first week mm -hmm. because for some people setting a wake time solves the issue, hmm. which is kind of nuts. But one or two of every eight patients who I see, because I see patients in groups of eight, will have a huge improvement from just having a consistent wake time because their body actually recalibrates and they start getting sleepy at a more consistent time each night because they're not doing that. And I do say in that first week, I take away the naps. I say, I don't care how you slept last night. You need to just stay awake until you're ready to go to sleep. No naps for now. Now, when I have patients, mm, probably older patients, like 80 and up, I'll be okay with a nap, but I'll often at this, at this stage, I'll say, look, nap, you have a nap opportunity of 25 minutes. And a 25 minute nap opportunity means you set the alarm for 25 minutes, you get in bed and it's going to go off 25 minutes later. And that's when you get up. I don't care how long you actually slept during that time, mm. because I don't want you going into phase three or phase four slow wave deep sleep during the day, yep. because that's what's going to really mess you up at night. Right. A stage, a stage two sleep nap is not really an issue during the day as much. It's not going to be so bad. But at this stage of the person with insomnia that we're talking about, I don't want them taking a one hour nap in the day. And they come back that second week having done the wake time that I said, and I then recompute how much time in bed they're spending. And then I still use that wake time and I then calculate their bedtime. And then the true time in bed restriction begins week two. Okay. But just to be clear, if you have someone who is using a nap to compensate for their insomnia, yeah. step one is just kill the nap. Kill the nap. And then let the cards settle where they may yep. for a week, yep. recalculate actual sleep time, and then go through the exercises exactly. described. Exactly. Exactly.